The United States Supreme Court has started hearing a case that directly challenges Roe v. Wade. A new study shows that abortion pill-related ER visits are up 500 percent since 2002. The city of Portland is providing bereavement leave for employees who have had an abortion. The West African nation of Benin has brought in abortion on demand and more coming right up. Stay tuned. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Pulse, a monthly roundup of important and interesting abortion-related news from around the world brought to you from a pro-life perspective. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this, is, if this is your first time, we share a little bit of the news and then provide some commentary from that pro-life perspective. My name is Peter. I'm the host of the program. And with me again is my wonderful co-host and excellent commentator, Cameron Cote. Thanks much, Peter. It's good to be back. And, and there's a lot to get through this month. I know last month, for those who tuned in for our, our most recent episode, there wasn't a tremendous amount happening on the, the stage of abortion-related news. Um, we've got a few more big ones coming out this week. And so please stay tuned. Some very, very interesting, some optimistic, some very pessimistic uh, looks at what's going on right now. But Peter, let's dive into it. Yeah, I guess the first big one, Cam, is that the United States Supreme Court has started hearing oral arguments in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case on December 1. This is a case that uh, centers around Mississippi's 2018 Gestational Age Act, which restricted abortion up to the first 15 months of pregnancy with some limited exceptions. The court will have to consider whether or not states can pass restrictions on abortion before the stage of fetal viability, which is somewhere between a, the ages of 20 to 23 or 24 weeks. And this really, Cam, is a decision that could redefine Roe versus Wade's standard for fetal viability, even more it could undermine Roe entirely. Cultural commentators like Jonathan Van Maren from the bridgehead.ca are saying that, and I quote, it is really possible that by this time next year, Roe versus Wade will be no more, end quote. Yeah, Peter, there's a ton of different angles that we could go with this one. And we are going to have several different guests on after the decisions are made, after the preliminary arguments, after a, a court decision is made to go real in depth on this. But I think that it's important for pro-lifers to not only unite in prayer, but also just do everything they can to try to get people talking about this issue because regardless of whether or not the the outcome is positive or negative and we have to admit that it has the potential to be massively positive or massively negative we have to accept that this can be a lightning rod towards sparking conversation with our friends family members members of our community and everyone else within our sphere of out, uh, sphere of reach that they're it isn't even a matter of tempering our enthusiasm, because as I mentioned, I don't want to be too pessimistic about this, that while, yes, this could mean an entirely new day for passing legislation on the state level that allows states like Texas and, and Ohio and Georgia and Mississippi and countless others that have been working on this to implement very restrictive legislation around abortion, tragically, there is also that potential that they rule against it and they say no. All states have to allow abortion. I mean, maybe this is just from my my very negative experience here in Canada, but there's been a tremendous amount of of negative, negativity around um, legal rulings here that are trying to further and further supposedly enshrine abortion as a constitutional right, that sort of thing. And so rather than setting ourselves up either for great success or great failure, I would say let's be prepared for either, but let's take advantage of this opportunity to spark conversations with the people around us. Because regardless of whether um, it comes out with flying colors, that it, it's the most positive thing ever, that doesn't guarantee that that legislation is going to um, come shooting down the tube immediately in your state, in your region there's still gonna be a tremendous amount of work, even if you're living in a place like Texas or Mississippi. And so this is an opportunity to elevate the abortion conversation to an area that it hasn't seen for a very, very long time. Let's take that opportunity. Let's unite in prayer in, in hopes and, and um, aspirations that this will have a very positive impact, but also, like I said, just using this as a lightning rod here and now, especially even Peter, you and I, we're, we're not even in America, we're in Canada, but we can use this as a lightning rod for conversations here. People around the world can do the exact same. Perfect. Thank you, sir. 
On episode 43 of the Pro Life Guys podcast, we had a conversation with Alison Centafonte from Live Action about the rise of abortion pill usage in the West. This abortion pill, um, which is two pills, but but is uh, really a take-home, um, do-it-yourself abortion, it's being marketed as a positive alternative to medical or surgical abortions, and really an easy solution to ending the life of your child in the early stages of pregnancy. One of the things that's rarely discussed, though, and we talked about this on the podcast, so if you want to learn more about the abortion pill and the rise of the abortion pill, that's episode number 43. One thing that's rarely discussed, however, are the side effects. A new study has been released by the Charlotte Lozier Institute that adds weight to the growing body of evidence on the side effects of the abortion pill. The study showed, as Live Action noted, and I quote, that the rate of abortion-related emergency room visits following a, a chemical abortion increased over 500% between 2002 and 2015 within the study population. A study population included women residing within the 17 states which provide Medicaid funding for abortion who were over 13 years of age and who had an abortion followed by a trip to the ER within 30 days, end quote. Here are some of the other things that this study found. Women who had chemical abortions had a 22% greater risk of an ER visit for any reason and a 53% greater risk of an ER visit for an abortion-related reason. Data also showed a drastic rise in the percentage of chemical abortions relative to the total amount of abortions. This ratio increased from 4.4% to 34.1% over the course of uh, from between 2002 to 2015, a rise from 4.4% to 34.1% over the same period of time. And the study also found that many of the ER visits for abortion-related complications were miscoded as treatment for a spontaneous miscarriage. Now, Live Action noted that this is not unexpected, and this is something that, that they've seen coming and they've seen happen, since women are often advised by their abortion providers to tell ER doctors they are experiencing a natural miscarriage, a natural miscarriage should such intervention be necessary. Now, Dr. Donna Harrison, who wrote about this, said that this is extremely, extremely dangerous and could lead to costly, painful, and even fatal mistakes. Yeah. Again, Peter, there's a, a number of different directions that, that go out um, from this news story. Obviously, very, very tragic that there's so many people ending up in hospital in the first place, so many people that are seeking abortion in the first place. And in the pro-life movement, our hearts go out to those women as well. Obviously, they go out to those children who are being killed through these chemical abortions, but it goes out to these women, the families around them, the entire thing. And I know that there are a tremendous number of pro-life entities across America and around the world that are still striving to support those who have chosen abortion for their children. And so first of all, the lie that we hear on street corners all the time about pro-life people not caring about um, post-abortive mothers and, and whatnot. Unfortunately, it's the pro-life movement who often has to deal with the collateral damage of an abortion decision. But similarly, how many times have I heard it thrown to me on the street that supposedly pregnancy is more dangerous than abortion? Not only is that bogus statistics, um, as we will actually be touching on in the future episode here, not only is that bogus statistics in the first place, but now with these rises in tragic um, life-threatening at times um, consequences from receiving the abortion pill. Um, I'm sure that those numbers will no longer be mentioned by anybody um, because the, the credibility is absolutely through the floor on that one, that there's no way that you can suggest that abortion is safer than pregnancy. The last thing that, that comes to mind on this, obviously, Peter, you and I have chronicled the push for increasing access to um, abortion pill. And I think that, that this is a result in some ways of stripping further and further regulations around the, the monitoring and who is receiving these abortion pills that not even during the COVID-19 pandemic, where there's been mail out abortion pills, you don't even need to take a sonogram or ultrasound to see the age of your child. But even before that, we were scrolling back um, and, and removing restrictions and limitations on mothers. And, and so these pills were being consumed and received by mothers that were far past the gestational limits that even the FDA had initially approved it for. The FDA is even um, suggesting they remove all kinds of restrictions regarding the abortion pill reception and consumption. 
And I guess that this just speaks to the desperate desire to fuel abortion in our country, not only the the economic fueling of it by by for profit companies like Planned Parenthood, but also just this desperate desire from people to abort their children. And I think that this, again, speaks to the need that we have in our world, in our countries, in our regions, in our town in our towns, even in our homes at times, to have these meaningful conversations, because especially with the um, anonymity that uh, that these abortion pills afford to many people, it is even more essential that you're having conversations with your, your family members, with your spouse, with your significant other, with your children even, so that they don't become not only a child that ends up in the emergency room because of a um, an outcome of the abortion pill reception, but also they they never find themselves in that pl- that place in the first place. And so very, very tragic, not unexpected tragically, but um, something that we need to address through better education and that we absolutely need to emphasize, especially as the FDA is seeking to remove, like I said, even more regulations around the reception of these pills. Thank you for that, sir. I, I think if you talk about the loosening of the restrictions, this study goes until 2015. In the United States, in 2016, restrictions were loosened a lot for the abortion pill. And so um, in one sense, we, we, look to see, we look forward to see what sort of stats are going to come after this loosening of these restrictions. But we're also fearful of uh, sort of the, the terrible nature that these stats are going to show. Um, and, and if we've seen a rise 500% rise in ER visits from a period where there were well, there were, were restrictions on the abortion pill, we're going to see that number rise even more. So all the more important to share the information about the abortion pill, to talk about it, to be informed about it yourself, and to, to know what the consequences are of taking the abortion pill procedure. Moving on, the city of Portland, Oregon has become the first in its nation to provide bereavement leave for employees after they have had an abortion. According to Oregon Public Broadcasting, and I quote, the city council unanimously approved changes earlier this month to their bereavement leave policy that that advocates say puts Portland on the cutting edge of abortion rights legislation. With that vote, advocates say the city became the first in its nation to allow public employees to take paid time off after an abortion. Under the new policy, city employees will be able to take up to three days of bereavement leave if they've had a miscarriage, stillbirth, or any other type of pregnancy loss. The policy states that this includes abortion, irrespective of whether deemed medically necessary, end quote. Andrea Miller, who's the president of the National Institute for Reproductive Health, had this to say, and I quote, it's important to recognize that employees need time to address their reproductive health needs, and they may need time to process what they're experiencing. A policy like this is a really important step forward in providing that kind of support and in and in recognition of the fact that we aren't just robots, end quote. Yeah, Peter, I, I think that in many ways, this is a fantastic step forward for, for the city of Portland. And, and it really shows a recognition of the the preborn child, especially as we focus on miscarriage and stillbirth. I think that that is a beautiful recognition of that life. I I have known many, many people who have shared their testimony about having experienced test, um, experienced miscarriages and stillbirths within their own families, within their own relationships, and sometimes even within their own lives. And I think that this is a beautiful, beautiful statement by Portland to recognize that, though it's obviously twisted with this um, cognitive dissonance around abortion, right? That they're going to empower somebody to have an abortion and then give them time off, recognizing in some ways the loss of a child's life, um, or, or should we say the direct attack on a child's life in the case of abortion. And so it, it doesn't seem to make sense that we are going to encourage and allow and enable and empower even in America people to have abortions while recognizing through legislation like this that it is a massive thing that, though they don't say it in the law, and I'm sure they're very careful not to write it into the law, this is because there's a human being who's been killed. And we know that people don't take abortion lightly necessarily, but we certainly don't take it seriously enough because if we did, we would respond to it similar to um, a born child being killed. We talk on the podcast, obviously, Peter, you and I all the time about likening preborn children to born children. And obviously, 
if if a parent lost a born child through a tragic accident or through illness or something like that, a two-year-old who tragically dies, absolutely appropriate for them to receive bereavement leave to cope with the the emotional and and psychological and spiritual roller coaster that they and their family are going to be on. Would it make sense if somebody intentionally killed their two-year-old to give them bereavement leave? I think it asks a deeper question. Should we be allowed to kill our two-year-old in the first place? Not should we give them leave? I, I think that that question is moot unless we can answer that first question. So I, I think it's beautiful, especially for the sake of those who are tragically experiencing miscarriages and stillbirths. And so beautiful for them, very nonsensical for those who are, are uh, choosing abortion. Um, we've covered on, on the show, Peter, that abortion is never medically necessary. And so um, the idea of not being medically necessary is um, not a thing at all, that abortion is never medically necessary anyways, but that's packing a whole bunch in there. Um, beautiful, but sad to see that this is reality, but is being addressed in Portland, I suppose. Thank you, sir. We're going to look at uh, two points of good news from around the world before I take it away to look at the four points of bad news that we're seeing around the world as well with some commentary. So uh, here are a few points of good news that we have. And one is from right here in Canada, where we are situated. Live Action reported that an abortion facility buffer zone, a buffer zone bill in Canada's central province of Manitoba was voted down for the second time. Now, we are not unfamiliar with buffer zones, uh, Cam, as, as you well know, which are zones around abortion facilities where any and all pro-life outreach is prohibited and is, is punishable with imprisonment or a large fine, or, or perhaps a combination of the two. Now, this buffer zone would have prohibited pro-life outreach outside of high schools as well, but thankfully, that buffer zone uh, bill was struck down uh, and voted down for the second time. And the second point here is in Israel, the Haaretz reported that the abortion rate, which has been on a steady decline for the last three decades, has continued to go down even during the COVID pandemic. They report, and I quote, Health Ministry released data on Tuesday showed that 17,548 women applied to terminate their pregnancy and 16,430 abortions were approved. The figures represent a 6.7% drop from 18,816 applications in 2019 and a 5.3% fall in the number of approvals from 17,355 in 2019. Last year's decrease was in line with, <clears throat> excuse me, last year's decrease was in line with a steady decline in abortions over the th last 30 years in Israel, albeit this one an unusually steep one, end quote. Yeah, very encouraging news. Um, nice to have something positive in the news about Canada here. Um, big shout out to our team out in Manitoba, Kyle Coffey, leading the crew out there. Maddie, our producer of this podcast and coordinating a lot of the volunteer outreach. Rose is part of the team out there as well. Um, and all the incredible volunteers, those who have done temp, temp staff positions. Really, really encouraging to see this. Would challenge people to consider continuing to record their participation around abortion facilities um, and high schools to show the consistent good conduct that is demonstrated there time and time again. We've had bubble zones here in Alberta, in Ontario, and many other places in Canada, and I'm sure in other places around the world. Bubble zones are a, a very, very great hindrance to being able to reach abortion-minded women with the um, truth they need, the support they need um, to help navigate whatever it is that they're going through. And I think there's been demonstrated time and time again how positive of a presence there often is. And yet when that's not documented, when it's not recorded, the media at times will spin whatever story they would like to be able to achieve their ends. And so big shout out to the folks over in Manitoba. Please do continue to record your presence there so you can demonstrate that without a shadow of a doubt, you're behaving incredibly and above any form of reproach. Again, exciting for Israel as well. Decreasing abortions anywhere is a very good sign. Love, it, love to see it in Israel as well. So very, very exciting what's happening um, in those two spots, Peter. Yeah, we're going to get some to some bad news now, Cam. There are four points here. I'm going to do two at a time, allow you to comment uh, in the middle of those. But here we go. So the West African nation of Benin has just legalized abortion. Prior to a parliamentary vote on October 20, abortion was only permitted in the cases of rape, incest, or danger to the life of the mother. 
Under the new legislation, however, women will be allowed to procure abortions at uh, in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy if it is, and I quote, going to cause a material situation, moral distress, affect their education or professional lives, end quote. In other words, Cam, Benin has brought in abortion on demand. According to CP24.com, I moved to Slovakia. Slovakia's parliament narrowly rejected proposed legislation that would have tightened access to abortion. The bill was rejected by one vote as 67 of the 134 lawmakers present in the 150-seat House voted in favor of it. A similar proposal to reject abortion was rejected a year ago, also by one vote. Among its key provisions, the mandatory waiting period for women to, uh, to have access to abortion at their request would have been extended from 48 to 96 hours, among some others. Currently, abortion is legal in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, and it is available after that for certain medical reasons. Yeah, I, I think that these are two very sad stories. Naturally, I think that there's been a, a tremendous response from many African nations. I In the last six months alone, I want to say that I've probably had at least a dozen different pastors from different places around Africa um, that are seeing abortion kind of start to, to infiltrate into their congregations, into their nations, um, reaching out to groups like CCBR who offer a ton of educational training. Um, for support. How do I help my, my congregation? How do I help the people in my community not choose abortion? How do I teach them that abortion is wrong and not an appropriate solution to what they're going through? Um, and so we've seen a, a very, very positive uptick in the leadership of the pro-life movement in some of these African nations, but, but tragic to see that Benin um, embracing abortion through the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Thankfully, there's a lot of foreign pro-life organizations. I, I speak to our uh, the group down in America, Center for Bioethical Reform, that are doing tremendous work in developing nations around the world to better equip and better educate um, pro-life leaders in those areas as well. And, and with regards to Slovakia, it it's difficult for me even to understand that this is coming up and, and so close on a vote. It's certainly encouraging that they are so close to passing this legislation, encouraging that it made its way to the parliament floor two years in a row. Um, tragic that it wasn't able to pass, but certainly high hopes um, for Slovakia that they are able to further limit their abortion um, access to fewer and fewer cases, saving more and more children year over year. We've spoken to people from pro-life Europe and other pro-life entities in uh, mainland Europe who have spoken very eloquently about the incredible work that they're doing um, in that area. And so big shout out to them, big shout out to all those who are working to lobby government officials and, and nominate and elect other officials who can um, vote in favor of restricting abortion. The education and politics go hand in hand so often. Um, we haven't seen a whole lot of movement here in Canada because we have a lot of catching up to do in the educational arm. Um, but for those nations around the world, especially so many in Europe, very, very encouraging to see they're not only keeping this conversation going in their parliament, but they are getting so close to passing legislation. Let's hope that next year, not only do they have another opportunity to vote on um, such an important issue, but they'll be able to finally push it over the edge towards actually accepting these restrictions. Now we go to Malta, uh, a very pro-life na nation, and Simon De Bono, the administrator of a pro-life Facebook group for Maltese Citizens, is saying that pro-life advocates are being arrested for hate speech. Hate speech being pro-life outreach outside of abortion facilities. Now, pro-life countries like Malta, like Poland, have been facing intense pressure from world, worldwide abortion advocates to legalize abortion and rid themselves of pro-life laws. And what we've talked about in the past, Cam, we've chronicled that uh, abortion advocates both internally and from outside of the country, the, the big organizations like the UN and others are, are sort of succeeding in getting their claws into the country uh, and prying away at the places that they can and convincing the people that they can uh, in their desperate grab to make abortion legal in those countries. So now um, those who are doing pro-life outreach, those who are recognizing the humanity of the pre-born children and ministering outside of abortion facilities or, um, or anywhere else, this is being considered hate speech. And then in the Republic of Ireland, pro-lifers praying and offering sidewalk counseling services outside of abortion facilities 
could face hefty fines and imprisonment under newly pro proposed buffer zone legislation, which was debated at a second reading in November by the Irish legislature. The proposed bill is called the Safe Access to Termination of Pregnancy Services Bill 2021 and would prohibit prayer and counseling for pregnant women around hospitals, abortion clinics, and some other areas as well. Yeah, again, frustrating to see this happening, but not surprising that abortion advocates are working, as you mentioned, to get their claws in wherever they can. And in Ireland, obviously, it wasn't enough for them to win the referendum in 2018. Obviously, it, it's not enough for them to have expanded abortion access radically since then, but they want to further silence pro-lifers from being able to offer accurate, compassionate information and support to mothers who view abortion as their only option. This idea, and we've talked about this before, Peter, this idea of being pro-choice, but so long as your choice agrees with what I think you should do, um, that somehow it's pro-choice to say that you can't even talk to somebody who's going to suggest a different choice is, is beyond asinine. And yet it's something that we're seeing in many different places. And, and it's something that we come back to on the podcast time and again, Peter, that the the evidence, the information, the facts about abortion and what it does to a preborn child are undeniable. And so how do abortion advocates win, quote unquote, win the conversation? They prevent the conversation. They don't have the conversation. They don't win with superior logic or even rhetoric. They win by preventing it. They win by distracting you or they they win by preventing the conversation. We see this attack in Malta. We've seen this with free speech um, challenges now in Ireland, but in other places. We even mentioned Manitoba earlier on here that they want to prevent the conversation because they're afraid of the conversation, because they know that when people, whether it's being confronted with the reality of what abortion does to a preborn child or whether it's being confronted at the, the 11th hour, at the very doorstep of an abortion facility, that the massive hearts and extensive support that pro-lifers can offer is somehow going to either cut the bottom line of an abortion um, provider or in some ways cast shade or doubt upon abortion decisions and whatnot. They're terrified of that. And so they want to prevent the conversation entirely. That's why we need to continue the conversation, regardless of how we're restricted. Applaud um, all those who are courageous enough in those countries and others to continue speaking for life, continue speaking in defense of freeborn children and their families. Um, this is incredible. This is absolutely necessary. And I hope that those of us who are still able to um, raise our voice, as it were, to defend these preborn children and their families continue to do so. We are going to face persecution. We're going to face hardship. We're going to face lots of different um, setbacks. And yet we need to continue to creatively adapt to ensure that this pro-life message gets out, not for our own sake, but for the sake of preborn children. And so um, again, discouraging to see these attacks and these pro-life long, long, um, long-standing pro-life bastions in Malta and the Republic of Ireland. Um, doesn't surprise me. Massive um, support and love for all those who are defending the pro-life cause in those areas. And please continue to do so because the babies desperately need you. Thank you, sir. And with that, we wrap up The Pulse, this month's monthly roundup of important and interesting abortion-related news from around the world brought to you from a pro-life perspective. Uh, the Pulse is a segment of the Pro-Life Guys podcast, so don't forget to subscribe, to hit that notification bell if you're on YouTube, to share this episode and many others with your friends and family as well. In previous episodes, we've talked about abortion apologet uh, pro-life apologetics rather, and what we would say on the streets to particular arguments. We responded to a very unfunny and quite cringy Saturday Night Live abortion skit where they uh, made abortion laughable with the use of a clown and so on and so forth. We've talked about how to effectively um, uh, engage with others on social media. So go check out some of those episodes as well. Um, we also want to say, Cam, that uh, this is November. Next month is December, which we didn't need to say that. But um, we are not going to be doing an episode of The Pulse for the month of December uh, to be released early January. Cam and I are going to be taking some time away from the studio. and. Uh, and hope to come back to do the polls at the beginning of February, where we are going to round up the news from both December and January, whatever is important uh, and interesting. So um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your patience with us as we take a break, spend some time with our families. We hope you do as well as we um, 
yeah, celebrate the, the, the birth of Jesus and, and spend some time with family. So Cam, anything final that you would like to say before we wrap this up, sir? No, just to, to reiterate what you said, definitely look forward to that uh, early February episode because I'm sure there'll be a tremendous amount of news regarding the the Dobbs versus Jackson Health Clinic. Um, also check out our, our flagship, the Pro-Life Guys podcast, which comes on every Tuesday that you can find on our website, prolifeguys.com or on your favorite uh, podcast catcher or YouTube, um, because we do hope to have a few very significant guests come on to share their thoughts regarding the the development of the case. And um, though we don't know yet when an outcome will be decided upon, we certainly want to hit you with that as soon as we possibly can. So please stay tuned for that on our regular Tuesday episodes and look forward to a maybe a little bit longer, but certainly a very packed episode coming out early February. Perfect. And if you want to reach out to us with any questions or concerns or thoughts or suggestions or whatever it might be, you can reach out to us on our website, prolifeguys.com, where we also have a full back catalog of all our episodes and an FAQ page, Kim. We have an FAQ page now. So any apologetic question that you might have, if we've talked about it on the podcast, you will find an answer to it on our FAQ page. Check it out, prolifeguys.com. You can also reach out to us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, I only use those. I mean, I talk about some others that from from time to time, but we we spend most of our time on those social media platforms. So check us out there. Like us, share this content and share it with your friends and family. Thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you tune in again next time. Mm-hmm.